Uh, we are in a series right now as a church on the Apostles' Creed. It is the most ancient creed. Um, it is an ecumenical creed. It is accepted by the Protestants, Orthodox, Catholics, uh, and it is an excellent summary of the Christian faith. If you've ever wondered to yourself, okay, what are the basics? Um, I know there's a lot of doctrines, but what are the basics? What are the fundamental foundational truths of the Christian faith? The Apostles' Creed gives you a really good summary uh, of those doctrines. And we've looked at multiple things together over the last several weeks. We've looked at God as our Heavenly Father. We've looked at the Trinity. We've looked at the virgin birth and sinless life and incarnation and substitutionary death, bodily resurrection, descent to the dead of, of Jesus Christ. So we've, we've looked already uh, at several doctrines. And last week we talked about the resurrection, and that was really, really exciting. I love the resurrection. I love that topic. Uh, tonight we're talking about the ascension. And this is, this is a doctrine that I don't think um, gets talked about all that much. Uh, we talk about the death of Jesus a lot, obviously. We talk about the resurrection of Jesus a lot, obviously. Uh, and we talk about the return of Jesus, Jesus' second coming, which is what we'll get to next week. But this idea of Jesus ascending to heaven and sitting at the right hand of God, for us it just seems like a, a necessary, well, what happened between the resurrection and Jesus' return? Oh, he ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father. But we don't really delve into the meaning and the significance of that. What does it mean uh, that Jesus ascended back to God, that he ascended back to heaven? What's happening? What is Jesus doing right now? Right? Is Jesus just relaxing, chilling uh, after uh, a lot of difficulty in his earthly ministry and everything that he endured and went through? Is he just relaxing or is there something that Jesus is actually doing up in heaven right now? And so that's what we're going to explore and I didn't expect to get quite as excited and jazzed about this topic as I did. Uh, I am now a big fan of the ascension of Jesus Christ, and hopefully you will see why as we go through this important and necessary doctrine together. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read from Acts and get into the content uh, of this doctrine. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for this chance to be together. And uh, God, thank you for technology that even when we have to cancel in-person services, we are still able to have something. We're still able to gather virtually. We're still able to be taught together, even though we're scattered in each other's homes. In some way, through this live stream, we're coming together, and you're teaching all of us, and we're experiencing this together as a community and a family in this moment. So God, thank you for that. Thank you for every person that is here, and God, I pray that you would speak through me. I don't know where people are at today. I don't know who's tuning into this, who's going to watch this uh, later in the week. Um, I imagine there are going to be people watching this who are coming from everywhere uh, on the spectrum from being devoutly Christian to being irreligious and not really sure what they believe about Jesus or that it matters to believe anything about Jesus. So, Father, I just pray that you would speak through me today and that what I say uh, would touch every person, wherever they are on the spectrum, that there would be something for everybody, that there would be something for unbelievers, that there would be something for believers. Uh, God, speak through me today. Reveal yourself through this message today. So, God, may everything I say be good and right and true and accurate uh, may I bring glory to you, may it make much of Jesus, and may it be helpful and encouraging and exactly what your people need. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the ascension is described for us uh, in Acts chapter 1, or at least the event of the ascension is described for us in Acts chapter 1. So I'm just going to read a few verses from there, starting at verse 1 of Acts one, if you got a Bible turn there, uh, I am reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I write the first narrative, sorry, I wrote <laughs> the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. 
After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. So, like I said before, we've looked at many aspects of Jesus' earthly ministry. At this point in the narrative, Jesus has died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He has risen bodily from the dead, according to the scriptures. As Luke says here uh, in Acts, Jesus spent 40 days with his followers. Uh, he, He taught them about the kingdom of God. And finally, he goes up on a mountain. And he says goodbye. And he ascends bodily back up into heaven. He goes back to be with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit. He goes back to be in the heavenly throne room of God, where he descended from when he added to himself humanity and was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary's womb. So Jesus has spent, we estimate, 33 years three of those years doing his ministry on the earth, and now he has bodily, physically left the earth. And he's gone back to heaven to be with God. But a promise is given, and we'll get into this promise more next week, a promise is given that just as he went up into heaven, he will return from heaven. So someday Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to come back bodily from heaven. And as the Apostles' Creed says, He's going to judge the living and the dead. And then there's the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So we're going to, we're going to get to those two topics later on. Today we're just going to ask, what is the meaning and the significance of Jesus' ascension? Is it just a stopgap? Is it just where he goes while he waits to come back to judge the living and the dead? Or is there significance to the act of the ascension itself and, and the being seated? at the right hand of the Father Almighty. I will say this. There are three things. There are probably many, many more, but three uh, things that I want to look at today that are meaningful and significant from Christ's ascension. So what is the meaning or significance of Christ's ascension? Number one, one of the meanings, one of the significances, I believe, is that Jesus' redemptive work is complete. One of the significances of of him going back to God the Father and sitting at the right hand of the Father is that he is declaring to the world that his redemptive work is done. It's done. It's finished. Right? We've talked about how uh, God is a loving Heavenly Father and he created us to have a relationship with him, but we rejected his love, we spurned his love, we turned away from him, ran away from him. As a result, we've ended up disconnected from God, and if we don't get reconnected to God, we are destined to be eternally disconnected from God, disconnected from the source of love and joy and happiness and satisfaction and, and pleasure and, and all of those beautiful, wonderful Things And so uh, we, we, we are in a state of disconnection, and we cannot do anything to reconnect ourselves to God. So God the Father and Jesus, they come up with this plan, and the Son of God comes down to earth to rescue us, to reconnect us to God. Jesus lived the life that we should have lived, 
And he died the death that we should have died. On the cross, Jesus absorbed up into himself the disconnection, the God-forsakenness that we deserve, and he obliterated it. And then he died and he rose three days later from the dead to declare to the world that he'd done it. He had overcome the God-forsakenness we deserve. He's conquered sin. He's conquered hell. He's conquered the devil and his demons. He's conquered death, right? Jesus has achieved all of these things through his sinless life, his substitutionary death, and his bodily resurrection. If this is a lot, go back and listen to those three previous sermons about Jesus' earthly life, his death, and his resurrection. Hopefully it makes sense. This is a quick overview. But, but Jesus has done all of these things, and now he's gone back up to heaven, and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and that is a declaration to the world that it's done. It's done. Finished is the work that saves. Jesus has done absolutely everything that is necessary to make us righteous, to, to bring us back into right relationship to God. Jesus has done everything necessary to make us right with God. It's been achieved. It's completed. It's done. And all we need to do now as human beings is believe. We need to entrust ourselves to Jesus as our Lord and Savior that he has done everything that's necessary to earn us forgiveness and earn us a place in heaven and make us right with God, we need to now believe that and entrust ourselves to Jesus to be able to receive his finished work. But Jesus sitting at God the Father's right hand is him declaring to the world, it's done. I, I achieved what I went down to earth to do. And through me is rescue from lostness to God and salvation to reconnection to God. I've, I've done it. Now, Jesus is sitting down at the right hand of the Father doesn't mean that he's now doing nothing. I did what I needed to do, and now I get to do nothing for thousands of years until I return, right? When we looked at God's creation of the world, Genesis says that he created everything that is from nothing in six days. As to whether those are literal days or metaphorical days, symbolic of ages, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever totally know uh, in, in this lifetime. We'll all find out when we get to heaven. That'll be one of the first questions, I'm sure, that many of us ask God. But according to Genesis, God created everything that is from nothing, and then he rested. Now, that doesn't mean that God has done nothing for thousands or millions of years, but rather he rested from the specific work of creating the cosmos. Now, what God is doing is he is sustaining everything. And since the fall of the universe, he has been active in human history, restoring us and restoring the creation. So that God rested doesn't mean that God is now doing nothing, but that he rested from that particular work. Jesus is not now inactive, but rather he's done that particular part of his ministry. It's finished. It's over. It's completed through Jesus, his rescue and deliverance and reconnection to God. And now what Jesus is doing is he is ruling. He is ruling as king through the Holy Spirit and through his church. Now we'll get to that in a moment. So that's significance number one. Jesus's redemptive work is complete. What is another meaning or significance of Christ's Ascension. Another meaning or significance is that now the Holy Spirit can come. It was necessary for Jesus to ascend so that the Holy Spirit could come. I've got to give a quick quip. Uh, quip? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've got to quickly explain the Trinity. I've, I've, I've talked about this in several of our sermons, but just to bring people up to speed who might not have heard those other sermons. Uh, what Christians believe is that God is triune. And what we mean by that is that God is one in nature and essence and substance, but that God has eternally existed in three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each of those persons is distinct, but each of those persons is fully and completely God, and there is one God. So you've got God the Father, fully and completely God. 
You've got God the Son, Jesus Christ, fully and completely God, and you've got God the Holy Spirit, fully and completely God. The Son of God came down. The Son of God became Jesus Christ and died for our sins and rose bodily from the dead and ascended back to the Father. So the Son of God has gone back, and now God the Holy Spirit comes down. It's necessary for Jesus to leave for the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus says this in John 16 to his disciples. He says, I'm going away to him who sent me. That's God the Father. And not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So Jesus has told his disciples, I'm leaving, and they're obviously sorrowful and distraught. But Jesus says to them, listen, it's for your benefit. It's for your benefit that I go away, that I leave you. Now, I read that and I think, that's crazy. That's insane. What are you talking about, Jesus? How could it ever be beneficial for you to leave us? Right? I, I'm sure many of you, I know I have, at many times I've thought, wouldn't it be amazing to live in the day of Jesus? Like, how awesome would it be to walk around with Jesus and see him perform all of his miracles, see him rise from the dead, like how awesome would that be? I'm 2,000 years removed from all of that. And I don't mean this to sound crass, but sometimes I'm like, the disciples got God in the flesh and I get a book. I get a book. And yet Jesus says here, no, 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 listen to me, disciples, Christians, you're better off if I leave. You're better off if I go. Why? Because if I go, the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, He is able to come. You and I, we don't have God in the flesh walking and talking with us. We don't have God in the flesh right in front of us, and we can reach out and touch Him. But what you and I have, Jesus is saying here, is far better. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God Himself living in us. Not God in the flesh in front of us, but God the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Jesus says, that's better. That's better. That's beneficial to you. More beneficial than my sticking around in the flesh. Now, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. You're probably like, well, hang on. The Holy Spirit shows up in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit shows up in Jesus' earthly ministry, right? We, we see the Holy Spirit before Jesus' ascension. Yes, the Holy Spirit has always existed, because he's God, and the Holy Spirit has always been active in the world. He was active in the Old Testament, and he would come on people and empower them to fulfill a particular calling of God on their life. He would come on people and empower them, like, like Samson. And the prophets, right? When we get to Jesus' day, obviously the Holy Spirit was active in the lives of the disciples, right? When Jesus asks Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter's answer is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Peter. You didn't figure this out on your own. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Holy Spirit has revealed this to you. And Jesus actually sends his disciples out to expel demons, to break the power of evil, to heal people. They couldn't have done those things uh, in and of themselves. They had to have the Holy Spirit empowering them. So the Holy Spirit was active in Jesus' day. The Holy Spirit empowered Jesus. The Holy Spirit was active before Jesus. So we're not saying the Holy Spirit was never on the earth prior to Jesus' ascension, but Jesus' ascension changed things. It changed things. As we just saw in Acts chapter 1, Jesus told his disciples, 
the promise of the Holy Spirit, it's going to come upon you in Jerusalem, so go and wait. And he says, you are going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and you are going to be empowered to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when we get to Acts chapter 2, that, that promise being fulfilled, the coming down of the Holy Spirit is described for us. It's recounted for us. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. So we have this dramatic description of the Holy Spirit coming on all of Jesus' followers. And all of a sudden, um, they are given the supernatural ability to speak languages they had never spoken before and never studied and never learned. Now we might be like, why in the world did that happen? Well, it just so happens that on the day of Pentecost, there were Jewish people from every known nation in Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit gave Jesus' followers the ability to proclaim the good news of Jesus in all of the different languages that would have been spoken by the Jewish people that were in Jerusalem. So the Holy Spirit gives them this supernatural ability to preach the gospel in such a way that absolutely everyone who's in Jerusalem will be able to understand. And they leave the room where they were, where the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they start speaking in all of these different languages. And the Jewish people are like, this is crazy. We're hearing about the works of God in our own language, and yet these things are being spoken by people that don't know our language and have never learned our language. How is this? Now, as always, there are critics. <laughs> Wherever God is at work, there are always critics. And there's a few critics that say, ah, they're just drunk. Now, I don't, I've never really understood that. Um, I've never actually been drunk myself, but I've been around a lot of drunk people, and people who are, who are drunk don't generally just suddenly develop the ability to fluently speak another language. That doesn't seem to be one of the side effects of drunkenness, but these guys are like, ah, they're just drunk. And Peter says this, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaim to the men of Judah and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. Come on, guys, it's early. <laughs> on the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days, and they will prophesy. Something changed with Jesus' ascension. Prior to Jesus' ascension, yes, the Holy Spirit was active in the world, but he would come upon people, and then he would leave people. And he wouldn't come upon everybody. He wouldn't be active in everybody. And he would come so long as somebody needed to fulfill a particular calling, and then he would depart, and he would leave. What happened with Jesus' ascension is that the Holy Spirit has now come down from heaven to permanently indwell not just a few special, hyper-holy spiritual Christians, but the Holy Spirit has come down from heaven to indwell every single follower of Christ, and not to indwell them for a period of time, but to indwell them permanently. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church, and everybody who entrusts themselves to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior gets the Holy Spirit. And if you get the Holy Spirit, that means you've got God himself living in you. You've got God in you, not God in front of you, but God in you. Yes, you've got God around you, God behind you, God beside you, right, as the traditional saying goes, but you've also got God in you. You are always, as a follower of Christ, continually in the presence of God. And at any time, you can access 
wisdom and power and strength and help from God. God is with you everywhere you go at all times. That's the difference. That's the shift that Christ's ascension enables. The minute you believe, people, the minute you give yourself to Jesus, you get God himself inside of you. God takes up permanent residence in your life. Paul says as much in Ephesians 1, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So Christ ascends into heaven and pours out the Holy Spirit on the church. And every believer gets the Holy Spirit and doesn't just get the Holy Spirit for a period of time, but gets the Holy Spirit permanently. We are sealed, indwelt, empowered by God himself as a result of Christ's ascension. And I love that it's every believer. I love what Peter says there, quoting from the prophet Joel, not just the rich get the Holy Spirit, but the poor. Not just the masters, but the slaves. Not just men, but women. Everybody gets God when they give themselves to Jesus. A third and final significance. Because there's no time limit due to our gathering in person, and because there's no singing and all of that other stuff, I get to preach for a little bit longer today. And I'm going to have to do that. And maybe God knew that this is, was going to happen. Um, a third significance, a third meaning is that of Jesus' ascension is that he has now been crowned king. We were going to sing crown him with many crowns today. Jesus has been crowned king. Now, what does that mean? What is Jesus the king of? Well, he's the king of the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is a massive theological category around which there is much debate. I can't possibly explore the kingdom in all of its breadth and depth today, nor am I going to uh, be able to answer uh, all of the objections to what I might have to say about the kingdom of God. So just, just bear with me. This is, this is super simplistic. But hopefully we can all at least agree on some of these things. The kingdom of God is God's rule and the sphere of that rule. The kingdom of God is God's rule and the sphere of that rule. Now we might say, well, doesn't God rule everything? Yes, God rules everything. God is the rightful king of the entire cosmos, and he is owed. You might not like this, but he is owed our devotion. He is owed our allegiance. He is owed our obedience and our worship. You might not like hearing that, Right? You might not like that idea, but that is just the way it is. God is the rightful king of the cosmos, and he has owed these things. But we rejected his kingship. We rejected his authority. We said we don't want this God to be king over us. We want to be our own kings. We don't want him to sit on the throne of our lives. We want to sit on our own throne. So we have tried, vainly, it's a futile effort, but we've tried to overthrow the authority of God in our lives. So God does rule everything, but as a result of our revolt and our rebellion, God's rule is not everywhere acknowledged, it is not everywhere expressed, it is not everywhere experienced. And that's because of our rebellion and our revolt. And also as a result of our revolt, we have subjected this world to self-rule. And we've subjected this world to the rule of the devil. That's hard to hear, but that's what we're told through Jesus and the apostles. And rather than building the kingdom of God, we have built kingdoms of division and hatred and violence and war and greed and lust and selfishness and materialism and, and consumerism and individualism and racism and misogyny, exploitation, dehumanization, these are the kingdoms that we have built in our world. And those are more often what we experience than the kingdom of God, which is peace and righteousness and justice and love and goodness. Now Jesus, 
the Son of God, he came into the world to reconcile everything back to God. That is, bring everything back under God's rightful, righteous rule. Through his life and his teachings, Jesus expressed the kingdom of God. You want to see the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God is like, what, what life is like under the rule of God? Look at Jesus. Look at his life. Read his sermon on the mount and watch him live out the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospels. Jesus came to express the kingdom of God, and everywhere he went, he gave people an experience, a taste of the kingdom of God, and he invited people into the kingdom of God. And the cross is multifaceted. Another thing that Jesus did on the cross was he paid the penalty for our traitorous, treasonous revolt. The judgment that we deserve for our rebellion, Jesus took that in our place on the cross and defeated it, paid our penalty in full and rose again from the dead. And through Jesus, we are able to escape the judgment that we deserve and we, through Jesus, can be pardoned and welcomed into the kingdom of God instead through repentance, that is, turning away from our rebellion, and through faith, that is, entrusting ourselves to Jesus. Now here's the thing. Jesus came to express the kingdom, give people an experience of the kingdom, invite people into the kingdom, pay the penalty for people's rebellion so that they can come into the kingdom. Jesus came to do all of these things, and Jesus succeeded perfectly at doing all of these things. And because of that, Paul says, for this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2. Paul elsewhere says that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he has put everything under his feet and appointed him his head over everything, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, again, he says that Jesus must reign until he has defeated all of his enemies, and the last enemy to be defeated is death. Peter says that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Jesus, at his ascension, in Matthew's Gospel, as he's going up into heaven, says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus succeeded at his mission perfectly. It's finished. It's done. And because of that, God has awarded to him rule over the kingdom. Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, through Jesus and now the church, is breaking into human history. It's breaking into human history. And for those of us who've given ourselves to Jesus, for those of us who've been pardoned, we are now citizens of this kingdom. We are citizens of that kingdom before we are citizens of this kingdom, of any of the kingdoms on the earth. Right? We are Christians before we are Canadian or American or any other nationality. And Jesus is our king. Jesus is our ultimate authority. Jesus is who we answer to before we answer to any earthly power. And for those of us who are citizens of the kingdom of God, we have been given the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt and empowered to, like Jesus, express the kingdom of God through our lives, give people an experience and a taste of life under the rule of God, and we are to proclaim that there is repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. We are to live out the kingdom and invite people into the kingdom through Jesus. And as people come into the kingdom through Jesus, the borders of the kingdom extend, the kingdom grows, and individuals, families, communities, yes, even cities, cultures, and societies can be transformed for Jesus. 
and become reflections of the kingdom of God. And someday, and we'll get to this more in the coming weeks, someday Jesus will return from heaven to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom, God's kingdom, will break fully into human history and will expel all other kingdoms, and Jesus' kingdom will be the only kingdom, and all of the blessings of his rule will be felt in their fullness throughout the whole cosmos. We're living towards that. That's our hope. We give people a taste of the kingdom now. And someday the kingdom will be here in its fullness. This is important. And I feel the need to dwell here for a minute. Christians, especially, listen to me. Jesus is the king. And Jesus is on the throne. He is on his throne no matter who is on the thrones of earth. Our hope is in his kingdom. Our prayer is for his kingdom to come. We want his name to be hallowed, his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth here as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. Our hope is not in who is in the White House. Our hope wasn't in Donald Trump and Mike Pence, and it isn't in Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris. It isn't in Justin Trudeau, or Anami Paul, or Jagmeet Singh, or Aaron O'Toole. It isn't in the United Nations. Our prayer is not for a liberal, or progressive, or conservative kingdom to come. We don't pray for the coming of a kingdom of the left, or a kingdom of the right. Listen to me, if you're following Jesus, you are neither left nor right. We've talked about this before, right? If if you're really following Jesus, you will be too liberal for the conservatives, and you will be too conservative for the liberals, and you will be too something else entirely to satisfy either of those camps. To be Christian is not to be right or to be left. To follow Jesus is in many ways a third way. Our hope is not in the politics of this world. Now, I'm not saying that the politics of this world don't matter because government policies have real world impact. I get that. I'm seeing that as Christians, we are not to bank everything on certain human leaders winning, on certain parties winning, on certain platforms winning. I'm deeply concerned because the language surrounding politics right now is apocalyptic. It's apocalyptic, right? If our party doesn't get into power, it's the end of the world. And this goes for both sides. And I think a lot of this has to do with secularism, right? The the disenchanting of the universe, the idea that we live in an imminent frame, to quote Charles Taylor, right? If, If this life is all that there is, there's no heaven, then we've got to experience heaven now. We've got to experience heaven now. And how do we bring about that heaven? We bring about that heaven through education and economics and politics and technology and medicine. That's how we bring about that heaven. And if there's no God and no spiritual realm, then it's up to human beings to achieve that heaven for us. And so we bank everything on certain human beings to, through these different things, bring about our heaven. If certain people get power, it will be hell. But if certain other people get power, it will be heaven, right? I I think politics is the new religion for a lot of people who live without God. But, But this thinking, in a different way, is flooding into the church. It's flooding into the church. I wanted to say seeping into the church, but let's be real, it's flooding where a lot of Christians believe that the church can't grow and the kingdom can't grow if the wrong people are in power. And that is just simply not true. It is not true. Jesus is on his throne no matter what. He will build his church. And through his church, his kingdom no matter what, no matter 
what? And listen to this, folks. Even if we lose all of our rights and our privileges and our freedoms, Jesus will still build his church and through his church build his kingdom. I'm not saying that we need to be passive about our constitutional rights. Right? Paul, on many occasions, used his Roman citizenship to his benefit. So I don't think there's anything wrong with making use of our constitutional rights. But hear me, even if all of those rights and those privileges and those freedoms are taken away and expunged, Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus is still king. And Jesus can still build his church and his kingdom. And he will. The reality is, is that for 2,000 years, Christian, Christianity has survived under every regime. Christianity has survived and indeed thrived without religious freedom and without democracy. We need to remember all earthly authority is delegated authority. It's delegated by Jesus. It's given for a time and then it is taken away. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will triumph. He will build his church. His kingdom will come. Evil will be decisively defeated, and death and tragedy will be no more. And to jump back to our, our series on the book of Habakkuk, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. These things will happen. They will happen no matter what happens here on earth. Jesus is king. And I felt the need to dwell here for a second because I think we're losing sight of this. We're losing sight of this. We're, we're getting far too wrapped up in earthly politics. And, and our perception, our outlook, and whether we are a people full of hope or a people full of despair, that is determined far more for Christians right now by the outcome of worldly elections than by the reality of the ascension of Jesus Christ to the Father's right hand. And for this, we need to collectively repent. We need to collectively repent. And I hope we can do that as individuals and as churches. Jesus' ascension, his redemptive work is complete. The Holy Spirit has come. Jesus is now king. I lied, there's a fourth, but don't worry, it'll be short. Jesus' ascension shows us where we're headed. Jesus, after his earthly ministry was done, he returned to be with the Father. After Jesus' earthly ministry was done, he returned to be with the Father. Here's the thing. Jesus' coming into the world has inaugurated the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is breaking into human history, but the kingdom is not fully here. It is only partially here. If the kingdom were to be fully here, all evil would need to be vanquished, and that means people would need to be vanquished because we are evil. Jesus wants to give as many people as possible an opportunity to escape the kingdoms of this world that will perish and enter into his kingdom instead. And so God has allowed a, last, a lesser manifestation of his kingdom to coexist with the kingdoms of this world, with those kingdoms of lust and greed and violence and hatred and racism. He's allowed his kingdom to coexist with those kingdoms, with the kingdom of darkness. And he's done that so that people from every tribe, language, and nation can be reconciled to him through the preaching of the gospel, the good news that in Jesus is salvation. This means, for us as believers, as Christians, this means that we get to experience many of the blessings of the kingdom, Forgiveness, a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. We even get to experience sometimes some extraordinary, very dramatic blessings of the kingdom. We get to experience healing in our midst, but we don't get to experience all of the blessings of God's rule yet. 
evil is allowed to persist. Our broken, fallen nature rises up against our new nature in the Holy Spirit, and we still do the things we shouldn't do. The world, not people, but the, the antichrist values and principles and philosophies of our, of our cultures, they, they influence us and they tempt us away from the way of Jesus. Satan and his demons, they still afflict us. We still experience the fallenness of our world. We experience natural disasters, sickness, disability, mental illness, aging, suffering, and death. And as followers of Christ, we also experience persecution because we're living the opposite, oftentimes, of the culture that surrounds us. We, we live for Jesus in a world that crucified Jesus. The kingdom is here, but it's not fully here. It's only partially here. It's not all the way here yet. And so we still experience all of this fallenness and this brokenness. We are in the in-between. And it is both glorious and beautiful and incredibly, incredibly hard. The Christian life is hard. Following Jesus is hard. Life in this world as it is, is hard. Jesus suffered. But then, when Jesus' suffering was done, he went to be with the Father. It's worth it to follow Jesus because when our time on earth is done, when we've fulfilled our calling, when our suffering is complete, like Jesus, we will go to be with God. We will go to be with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We will get to see God in all of his glory, we will get to see Jesus face to face. I love what Paul says in Acts 14, 22. He says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. I love what Jesus promises in John 16, 33. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. What is Jesus' ascension mean? It means that his redemptive work is done. You can give your life to Jesus and know that you will be totally and completely made right with God and forgiven for everything, and you will be destined for heaven. Jesus' redemptive work is done. The Holy Spirit can now come and permanently indwell every single believer. Jesus is King. His kingdom is breaking into human history, and he will someday vanquish all evil. Right now, he's pushing back the darkness, and someday the darkness will be expunged. Jesus is king. And like Jesus, when our suffering on earth is done, we will go to be with the Lord. This is the meaning and significance of Jesus' ascension for us those of us who are in Christ. This is what it means for us. For those of you that are not in Christ, you can give your life to Jesus. And he can become your king. And you can get the Holy Spirit. And you can be made right with God. And you can know that when your suffering on earth is done, you'll go to be with God forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing doctrine for everything that it teaches. Apply to our hearts in the way we need it to. In Christ's name.